Hello, uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, welcome to all uh, for this IWSP Holistic Wellness Batch Number Six. Exactly uh, six o'clock India time. So we'll start. Uh, so thank you so much for joining on time. So myself, um, I'm Naresh. Um, I'll be. I'm one of the volunteer of this IWSP. Uh, joined the session one. Benefited a lot. From there, I've been trying to support the IWSP activities um, on my personal interest. So, so I'll be uh, entire uh, complete uh, next eleven sessions. I'll be your host. I'll be moderating, but there is very less uh, for me to scope because the content is so rich that both the doctors will have a huge talking to do. Uh, but still, I'll be your contact point. Uh, so, with this, we'll start. So this is day two. So if you remember, most of you have attended the introductory, complimentary introductory session day one. So that is day one, and today it is day two. So before we get into this, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, agenda for the day, um, just to give you an update on this program is going to run three days a week. For India time, it's going to be every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday between 6 a.m. to uh, 7.30 or a little bit more here and there, 7.45 a.m. we can call. The same program repeats 12 hours from uh, the same time. So the same day, I mean, for India time, but U.S. it will be a little different. It will be Monday evening and then Tuesday morning. Same thing with the uh, EST as well as PST times. So I repeat, for India time, I'll talk in the, to avoid the confusion so that others can calculate it every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, India time, 6 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. The same day, after 12 hours, it gets repeated. So first one or two days, it may be a little confusing, but after that, you will get settled. And we'll keep give all the information through WhatsApp. So don't worry about it. Second request is, uh, please be, uh, you know, keep watch on our WhatsApp group. There'll be a lot of communication happening about the program through WhatsApp. There'll be easy one way communic uh, easy one go communication. So we use that. Also, we send an email to all of you. So with this, uh, we'll get into the day two activities. So um, I, whatever I'm doing is an introduction about the program and little few more things I'm going to talk about it. Followed by uh, the overall program introduction day two. Uh, so you know uh, we have a pillars dash, but we have not got into the dash. We'll talk. We'll we'll listen all these what is dash and all those stuff from Dr. Sushil in detail. But today is going to be a second introduction on inflammation repair healing, uh, followed by Dr. Sushil's question and answer that will go about forty minutes. Uh, after that, it's going to be. Uh, Dr. Daya Deepananda, as well as uh, Bupender, will take us through uh, in a, talking to us about the medical benefits of today's learning. Every day we are going to learn new asanas. Today we are going to learn, we are going to start with yogic jogging, shukshma vyama, uh, and a couple of pranayamas we are going to practice. <laughs> so Dr. Swamiji will talk about the medical benefits of each one, and then Bupender will do a practice. So. Followed by Dr. Swamiji's question and answer also. So this is agenda for the day. A few uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, this being the first day, I'm going to take a little more time and detail about it. Um, join this session in a spacious, quiet and ventilated room. It's important because you're not just going to listen. You're also going to do some practices. Uh, so be ready with your yoga mat. Probably sit next to the yoga mat. Uh, listen to the session and then second half of the session will be going to uh, practice. So be ready, uh, probably sit on your yoga mat directly also, which is fine if you can sit on the floor. Otherwise, you can sit on the chair and then move to yoga mat as and when uh, as good to. Maintain the gap of three hours from me. Um, this is mainly since you want to do some kind of practices, it's needed. Uh, it could be a little uh, 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 I mean, 
for India participants, it will be easy. Uh, for US participants, you need to plan a little bit. Uh, next one is join the session through laptop, desktop, not through mobile or tab, only for your convenience, uh, just to get a full view. And if you could connect your laptop or desktop with your uh, TV in a bigger screen, it will be much more effective. And their family can watch it uh, and can practice it together. Please keep uh, cell phones away from the room. <clears throat> Don't get distracted. Please have a good internet connection and keep check on it. Uh, wear loose, comfortable yoga dress so that it will be easy for you to do the asanas. Please put on your videos uh, and then do the practice while doing the practice. Need not be when you are listening, but when you are practicing, it will be, be good. It will encourage other people also to you know practice and join with all of us. We are all sitting virtually, remotely, and this will give a togetherness feeling that everybody is doing it. We can look at each other and we can do that. So try to put on your videos. It is not mandatory, but we will request. Please read through the handouts. Every day, at least some 12 hours before the start of the session, we'll be sending out one handout. <coughs> Yesterday, we have sent out. <clears throat> this handout is what all the learnings we are going to do on that particular day. That is what this handout will uh, explain on Asanas. Uh, this we already talked about it. Uh, one more request is uh, when you are joining, please register. Put your registered name uh, with us so that the backend team will not take you out because they should not be thinking that somebody else joined. So request you registering and then put your name. Whatever the name you have given for registration, use the same name for Zoom as well. This is our helpline number. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be circulating it in our WhatsApp group also through email also. <coughs> Any doubts, any clarifications you have about the program, anything, please connect with uh, this number. We'll be more than happy to help you. Uh, just a brief uh, one minute introduction about our all three facilitators. Uh, Dr. Sushil K. Sharma, who is a board certified consultant cardiologist. Um, he lives in US, he's an Indian, has got uh, studies in India, UK, and then uh, practices a very, very long time in US, one of the renowned uh, cardiac surgeon in the world. Uh, Dr. Swami is Dayadipananda. He's a doctor by profession. He's a medical superintendent of uh, Ramakrishna Mission Hospital. His passion towards yoga and knowledge and science, he being a doctor, is unique blend and you will enjoy him talking. Uh, he's also has got a great passion uh, in handling diabetic, uh, especially the type 1 diabetic cases. Uh, next comes Mr. Bhupender, who is our yoga uh, no, practitioner. He teaches. He has done his master's in yoga uh, and then diploma in yoga and naturopathy. Uh, he's the third facilitator for us. With this, without further delay, I'll move on to Dr. Sushil Sarma's talk. And in the meanwhile, if you are getting any question, please note them, put them in your chat box. After Dr. Sushil Sarma's talk, you will have one Q&A session with him. After a uh, yoga session, you will have one Q&A session separately. So try to use the chat box. Uh, it will be easy uh, so that the host will read out one by one all the questions and get them answered. Without further delay, I'll move on to Dr. Sushil's talk. Uh, thank you very much, Narendra. Uh, welcome to all. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, in the introductory session that I did, everything that I'm going to expand on from here on in the next 11th session was the synopsis of that. So one more thing before I go further, because a lot of you have very specific questions and I request that hold off the specific questions, get the general principles first. And there's a reason for that. The reason is when you 
hear something, listen to something, or read something, you learn something new, and, and we call it knowledge. But then when you go ahead and experiment with that knowledge and develop your own experience, that really is the wisdom that you need. Once you have that kind of knowledge, the wisdom, then your mind will teach you and tell you what is the right and the wrong thing to do. And that is much more enduring than listening to somebody or reading something. So good thing is that whatever we're going to talk about right now, we're going to give you ample time to experiment along with us and experience and develop your own conclusions and have your own knowledge and wisdom. So before I go into the specific recommendations that we have for wellness, I want you to understand these four mechanisms. Now, I do understand that one or more or all of them may be new to you. You may have not heard of them before, but stay with me and I'll explain each one of them in very simple language so that we can all understand. And why do we have to understand this? Because once we understand by diving deep, what exactly is I'm doing to my body by putting something in my body or not putting something in my body, then your understanding becomes much better. So in today's session, I'll be focusing mainly on chronic inflammation, with a little bit of endothelial injury. Now the circadian imbalance, I'm going to take up again when I do the activity and sleep with you and I'll expand on that. And autonomic imbalance also when I discuss about activity and yoga and stress reduction and habit change, I'll be talking at length about autonomic imbalance and brain and cerebral cortex, habit center and all those things. So today we're going to focus on chronic inflammation. So all these things, some of you may have had or heard that some of the family member or you yourself had a blockage in the artery and that blockage was treated by the doctor with a stent and the chest pain was gone and now you have a stent in your artery. Some you may have heard had severe excruciating pain and ended up with a heart attack in the hospital. Some of you may have heard went in with chest pain and they found a lot of blockages. They had to cut open his chest and put bypasses on the arteries. Now, you have all heard of these kind of people and this can happen to anybody. And we know that this is also a lifestyle disorder. So where does this come from? This formation of blockage inside the artery called atherosclerosis is also a type of inflammation. So this is the inflammation that occurs inside your artery that then results in either a heart attack or for you to require a stent or for you to require a bypass. So it all begins with that inflammation. And that is why you have to fully understand what is inflammation? How does it begin? What do you do to prevent it? And what is it that you should not be doing to prevent it? So this is basically what happens in every cell in the body. Whenever there is somewhere an injury in your body, and, and we'll talk about injury outside, it results in inflammation. Inflammation is body's response to contain the injury, send different items to the injured segment to heal it and repair it and remodel it. So this is how all injuries happen. So let's take an example of how acute injury happen. We have all had either this or something like this happen to us in a life where you get a mosquito bite or you get a bee bite or you get bitten by a snake. And then you see what happens. The skin becomes red, it's hot, it's painful, and it's swollen, inflamed. And sometimes because of intense pain, you cannot move this leg and there is loss of function. So these are the signs of inflammation. There is pain there's heat, there's loss of function, there's swelling, and there's redness. Now this you see on the surface outside, and you've all seen it, right? But when it happens inside, there may not be pain. There's loss of function that you may not see, but the test may detect it. 
there may be swelling which may present as pain or may not present as pain and you may not know it unless the swelling has become very big. And there may be heat again which may not be perceptible outside and the redness may not be seen. But similar mechanism occurs in inflammation outside the body. Similar me mechanism occurs inside the body in the organs of body. So give you one more example. We have all at some point in our life have broken bones. I fell down from scooter, broke my clavicle once and broke my scaphoid once. Twice I fell down from the scooter. So every time you break a bone, what happens? There's an injury, right? Whenever there's injury, there's inflammation. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is body's response of sending substances to the injured segment to heal it. So there is more fluid coming there, more blood flow there, more white blood cells there, more macrophages there, more proteins come to that place, more nutrients come to that place. All this gets packed up in that place. And that is how you get that swelling and pain and redness. But all that is doing is for it to heal it. So when you heal it, for example, when the bone edges are put together and then swelling subsides and they give you medicines for swelling, subsiding swelling, eventually you see the bone heals, repair, and you recover. And this process is called acute inflammation. So inflammation is painful and that is what prompts you to seek medical advice. And then that inflammation results in repair and recovery. So in that respect, inflammation is good because that is the body's way of telling you that something has gone wrong in your body. I am inflammation. I am doing the healing. I will repair it and I will recover it. But if you keep doing it over and over and over again, then it is called chronic inflammation. You keep going in there, keep sending substances there to repair. And eventually what happens is through some different mechanisms, the repair becomes impossible. And then that inflammation becomes chronic. Chronic means you now have great difficulty in reversing it, healing it, repairing it, and recovering it. So these processes of chronic inflammation that go inside your body are actually what are causing your lifestyle disorders. And we'll, we'll discuss that in detail how. So I told you in chronic inflammation, the injury is recurrent. Inflammation persists, never subsides. And therefore the healing is poor, recovery is incomplete. And that organ that had the inflammation gets damaged. So let's see some examples. Acutely, you see this all the time. Those of you who are allergic, they know. Their nose starts running. And why does the nose start running? Because inflammation brings in fluid. Fluid wants to get rid of the irritant. And that is why you have nasal discharge, sneezing, and headaches from allergies. Same thing in acute infections. You have infection in your lung, you get pneumonia. There's inflammation going on there, which is trying to fight the infection. Same thing in injury and burn. So this happens acutely, we saw. But there's also chronic inflammation that goes inside the body. I've only mentioned four organs here, predominantly lung, liver, and heart, and cancer. They're all these disorders are actually the end result of chronic inflammation, which has failed to subside in your body. So you see all these things. Some of you may say, doctor, I have a thyroid, which is underactive. Well, you have underactive thyroid, which is requiring now a medicine, right? And you take Synthroid or Thyroxine, and that's a supplement. But before you got to that stage, what had happened? Your thyroid gland had inflammation, had thyroiditis. And that inflammation went on and on and on. Unfortunately, you were not aware and you do not take measures to prevent the inflammation. Now you're left with a thyroid that has lost its function. And the only option left to you now is to take a supplement. Same way in the brain, chronic inflammation goes on and eventually it results in degeneration. And all the degenerative disorders come in that group, the Alzheimer's, the Parkinson, the multiple sclerosis. Same thing, you get inflammation in the eye. You get inflammation in the pancreas. If your pancreas become inflamed, 
for a long period of time, they stop functioning, they stop producing insulin, and what do you get? Diabetes. Same thing in the liver. When the liver gets inflamed, what do you get? Fatty liver, right? So all these are inflammations. And then there is another type of inflammation, which is called autoimmune, where your own body fails to recognize your body organs, treat it as foreign, invades those organs, keep causing them to have inflammation, and you're left with autoimmune disorders like some ulcerative colitis or lupus erythematosus or some arthritis that you get. But all that really is chronic inflammation. So now you know all these disease entities that I mentioned, you can actually prevent them, control them, or reverse them by reversing, preventing, or controlling chronic inflammation. So that is the fundamental importance of you to understand what is chronic inflammation and how do you then take care of chronic inflammation. So let's go through some examples of chronic inflammation of internal organs. I showed you an inflammation of the skin, then I showed the inflammation of a bone that's broken, then I showed you the thyroid that gets inflamed. What happens inside? Because you don't see it, unfortunately, pancreas and liver, you don't see the inflammation going on for a long period of time until the damage is done. And then you go back and your doctor tells you, oh, you're left with this damage and we're going to give you this medicine. You have no other choice. But there was a choice. There was a choice to be aware of inflammation. There was a choice to be aware of the do's and don'ts that prevent and take care of inflammation so that you would not have had to face the eventuality of chronic inflammation damaging the internal organ. So again, coming back to this, <clears throat> I talked about either you get a stent or you get a heart attack or you get bypass. I told you it's all atherosclerosis or atheroma or inflammation that comes inside the artery and blocks the artery. So, so let's see how does this begin? How does this happen? And why it is important for you to understand what I'm going to say right now in order for you to understand how you can then go ahead and prevent stent, bypass, and heart attack. So if you look at this, in the left panel is your body showing all the arteries. Arteries are the blood vessels that take blood and nutrients to all parts of your body. Even your skin has small arteries called capillaries. If you pick up your nail like this, see how pink it is, and you squeeze it, and it blanches and then you release it, it again becomes pink. So what happened when you squeeze it, you block the artery. When you release it, the artery fills up with the blood. Similarly, the artery is going everywhere. So if you block an artery, you reduce the circulation. You reduce the circulation, you cause inflammation. And inside the artery is a one layer called endothelium. This is one layer inner lining of the artery. Just like a pipe has an inner lining, this artery has an inner lining. It's very important to maintain the integrity of this inner lining, that one cell structure called endothelium, the shining inside of a pipe, the artery. So why is it important? So this is a cut section of one artery. So what we're doing right now is showing you there's blood circulation in the artery, but somehow this blood is loaded with cholesterol. This person repeatedly with his breakfast, lunch, and dinners eats a lot of high sugar, high fatty food, which is very high in fat and cholesterol. And this cholesterol is bathing these arteries because once you have cholesterol that you eat, then it goes in your body, then it gets absorbed from your gut, it goes into circulation, it circulates to every part of your body. And this is the cholesterol I'm showing here, which is circulating through the blood vessel called the coronary artery that supplies blood to your heart. So what happens now? What happens is because of the other factors such as sheer stress or blood pressure or smoking, this endothelial lining becomes weak and then there is injury to this, cholesterol enters inside, and then cholesterol causes inflammation. Inflammation makes foam cells to form. And now you're saying the beginning of the blockages following, for, forming inside your coronary artery. What happens next? Now, when it becomes very big, sometimes for reasons unknown to us, that 
blockage can rupture. Once it ruptures, then all that fatty material that is inside the artery comes out and it reacts with the blood clot in your blood and it blocks the artery completely. Now you can see with this blockage in the artery, no blood can flow through this artery. When the blood flow stops through that artery, now your heart is not getting any blood. Remember I told you when you squeeze this and stop the blood flow, it goes blanched and then you release it, the circulation starts. Same way in the coronary artery, when this blood clot forms inside the artery, right? And closes the artery, you have no circulation. And now you get the chest pain and you get the heart attack. So let's reverse it. How did the heart attack happen? Because there was a blood clot inside the artery. Why was there a blood clot inside the artery? Because there was a plaque inside the artery, inflammation. Why was there inflammation? Because there was smoking and high blood pressure and high cholesterol that contributed to the formation of this plaque, which was nothing but chronic inflammation. But doctor, I didn't know it. I was fine one day and suddenly one day I got a heart attack. Yes, before you got to this stage of the plaque rupturing and forming blood clot, you probably have been causing inflammation in your artery for 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. How? The lifestyle that you led, which was sedentary, which was inactive, which had high cholesterol, high sugar, which had high blood pressure, which caused high salt and high blood pressure. All these factors gradually contributed to this inflammation forming inside the artery, enlarging and coming to the extent where it ruptures and causes heart attack. So now go back. Now go back and think about yourself. How do I find out I have a blockage or not? You don't need to do a test. Look at your lifestyle. If you're smoking, you're sedentary, you're inactive, you're not doing yoga, meditation, pranayama, you're eating too much sugar, you're eating too much fat, you're obese, you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, you are forming the inflammation. You don't need to do any test to know that you are forming it. So now that you understand that all these lead to chronic inflammation and there is no discrimination, the these factors that I told you, the high sugar, high fat, inactivity, poor diet, it is equal opportunity inflaming agent. It's not that it will cause inflammation in me and not in you. It is causing, you don't know it, but it's causing inflammation. So I told you what you eat flows in a blood vessel. So I'm just showing you this. Look at this pipe. This is a very dirty water coming out of this pipe. This is an effluent pipe. So if this kind of material flows inside this pipe, what do you think is this pipe going to look like in 10 years? Because this pipe is has dirty water in it, right? This is what it's gonna look like. The inside is gonna be corroded, inside is gonna be inflamed. And I tell you, those of you who have seen the angioscopic pictures of the inside of coronary arteries, and if I put you that little middle picture that I put here of the pipe and show you nothing else, you will not be able to tell whether this is a pipe or this is a coronary artery with chronic inflammation, which is about to cause rupture and cause heart attack. So it's very important. What do you bathe your endothelium in? What is flowing in your coronary arteries? What is flowing in your coronary arteries? This is the pipe. This is exactly the pipe that's going to your heart and to your brain. So if this pipe gets corroded, like the pipe in the middle there, going to the brain, you get a stroke. If this pipe gets corroded, going to the heart, you get a heart attack, and then you need angioplasty, stand, and bypass surgery. So where it all began, it was chronic inflammation. Okay, so going to another organ. Now these days, a lot of people in India are doing a lot of tests for this fatty liver. And they so say, where did this fatty liver come from? Well, bottom line, it came from too much fat, too much sugar, okay? So when you add lots of fat, lots of sugar, to a certain extent, the liver can handle it. When extra sugar comes in the body, the liver says, okay, 
this guy has eaten more than he should have. Maybe he had two rasgullas more than he should have. And now I have to take care of this extra 20 grams of sugar or 40 grams of sugar that he got. What does liver do? Liver has a way of converting it into glycogen. It converts to glycogen and keeps it in the liver. So that tomorrow, if you're not eating or you're running and you suddenly need energy, the glycogen will be broken down to sugar and that gives you energy. So it's a good thing that liver stores sugar as glycogen. But there's only so much glycogen it can store. And then what happens after that? After that liver says, no, I can't store it anymore. I will convert into fat and I'll store it in the belly. I'll store it in the shoulders. I'll store it on the hips. I'll store it on the thighs. And that is what is extra fat. Unfortunately, when there is too much fat in the body, then same fat also comes and attacks your liver. And what do you get? Fatty liver. So repeated injury because of overstressing the liver with sugar and fat causes persistent inflammation. Some of this liver has a capacity to handle and heal and it does. And then it gets tired of doing that. And then you have a fatty liver. Now, a lot of people told me when I did this uh, IWSP one and two, doctor, we, we want to do an ultrasound to find out if I have a fatty liver or not. No, you don't need to do an ultrasound. You basically stand in front of the river, in front of a mirror sideways in your underwear, take your shirt off and look at your stomach. If your, if your belly is protruding in front of your chest, that means you have fat in your belly, which means there is fat in your omentum, which means you have trunkal obesity. Be rest assured you have already started the beginnings of the fatty liver. You don't need an ultrasound. You just stand in front of the river, uh, from the mirror, take your shirt off and look at your chest and see how far your belly protrudes in front of the chest. And that is the beginning of the fatty liver. So where did the fatty liver come from? From chronic inflammation. What was the culprit for chronic inflammation? Too much fat, too much sugar. So now you, you understand you're connecting these things. So next time when I talk about diet and I talk about sugar and talk about fat, immediately, you know, oh my God, yes, now inflammation, liver damage, I understand it all completely. Same thing with uh, alcohol. When alcohol goes inside the liver, a liver has an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. It can break down the alcohol. And then if it breaks down, it breaks down to carbon dioxide and water and it's taken care of. But if you keep loading the liver with alcohol, more alcohol, daily alcohol, extra alcohol, the enzyme gets depleted. When the enzyme gets depleted, then this alcohol that goes inside the liver, which is not broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase, causes inflammation and injury in your liver. When this injury and inflammation happens for a long time, then you get liver damage and you get liver failure. So that is why we say too much alcohol is bad for your liver. What is the mechanism? Chronic inflammation. Okay, what happens smoking? Every time you smoke and you send these particles inside your lungs, the alveoli have beautiful thin lining, very delicate lining. And when you're hitting that with smoke, you cause injury. Now, some of that injury is healed. As I told you, every inflammation in the body is healed, but there is a limit to how much the healing can happen. So if the injury is persistent, the inflammation is persistent, there's poor healing, poor recovery, you are left with COPD, you get the lung cancer. So where did it all begin? It all began with inflammation. And what caused the chronic inflammation in your lung? The cigarette smoke. Okay, so that is uh, in short what chronic inflammation is. And actually in our diet, we have some wonderful things that reduce inflammation. So when I discuss with you the diet, I will be constantly mentioning to pro-inflammatory diet and anti-inflammatory diet. The diet that causes inflammation and is bad for you, the diet that improves inflammation and that is good for you. So all these things that you're seeing here, the uh, turmeric, the clove, the uh, uh, black pepper, the uh, cardamoms and these uh, chili peppers, all these Indian spices, great, great anti-inflammatory agents. 
So if you spice up your food, spice up as much as you can. Multiple different spices, not just chilies. Lots and lots of uh, turmeric, lots and lots of cinnamon, lots and lots of clove. Some of you are diabetic may have heard of this. Some people actually take extra cinnamon for treating the diabetes. And actually, there's one more thing you may try again. Some of you who have sugar with your tea, first of all, don't have sugar with the tea. But if that is what you need, do me a favor. Next time what you do is, if you take two spoon of sugar in your tea, what you do is you only put one spoon of sugar and then you put a pinch of cinnamon. So what cinnamon does is it has its own inherent sweet taste, which also multiplies the sweet taste of the sugar. So just by putting a pinch of cinnamon, first of all, you're getting the best effect of the cinnamon. You're also reducing your sugar by 50% because you cut down from two spoons to one spoon. Your tea will taste better, sweeter, and you've cut back your sugar. But remember, what I tell you is zero sugar, but at least try to get to 50% sugar this way. Okay. So what is the best anti-inflammatory recipe? You all must be wondering, we talked about inflammation. So doctor, I just want to have no inflammation in my body. Give me what is the best recipe. I don't want to do this spice and that spice. Give me actual practice that I can do, which is anti-inflammatory. Actually, our whole program is anti-inflammatory program. So four important areas in your system that cause inflammation are diet, poor activity, poor sleep, excessive stress, and some bad healthy habits. I told you the healthy habits are sugar, smoking, too much sugar, too much fat, alcohol, all those things. So really our whole wellness program is geared towards preventing inflammation. And I told you that inflammation so that now when I go on to the next session of diet and I explain to you the diet, the do's and the don'ts, it'll be very clear to you where I'm coming from, okay? So this is the natural detox. Now in India, there are a lot of people that go, oh, where are you going? I am going to go to such and such center for 30,000 rupees or 80,000 rupees for one month and I'm gonna be detoxed. Everybody goes, politicians goes, prime ministers goes, everybody goes for one month of this detox. You know, why do they need to go for one month of detox? Because they are treating their bodies with toxins for 11 months a year. Why can't you lead a detox, anti-inflammatory life so that you don't have to go for one month detox? What is the point in filling the, your whole body with filth and then going somewhere and cleaning and coming back and filling with filth again? That is a wrong lifestyle. The right lifestyle, which is the detox lifestyle is not going to any detox program. It is eating a diet, which is anti-inflammatory diet, leading a life that is active, living stress-free, having good healthy habits, getting good sleep, avoiding too many of these medicines like antibiotics, antacids, non-steroidals, painkillers. You take all these painkillers, arthritis, ibuprofen, these things because you don't do yoga, because you don't lubricate your joints, because you don't stay active. Then you take this Motrin and ibuprofen, the non steroidal and that leads to acidity. Then you take antacids. So all these things you have to understand, they are the end result of bad lifestyle causing inflammation. Avoid toxins, avoid chemicals, don't eat processed things. Anything that is processed is processed and preserved with chemicals. You take a banana and you leave it outside, after three days it goes stale. So why is it those are the Chiquita bananas that come from Colombia, they stay good for 30 days because they're radiated. So they're toxins, they're chemicals. All food that looks to you beautiful, clear, shining, and stays for a long time is treated with chemicals, treated with toxins. Eat fresh, eat whole food, eat healthy, eat local. So if you eat local food, fresh food, healthy food, avoid preservation, avoid toxins, avoid chemicals, you avoid inflammation. And then the biggest anti-inflammatory is yoga, 
meditation and pranayama so yoga is not just taking care of your joints Swamiji will explain to you later all these asanas that you do where you're twisting your body and you're doing these pranayamas you are actually also working your internal organs your kidneys your liver your pancreas they are also doing yoga when you do yoga physical yoga and asana yoga and meditation the greatest anti-inflammatory medicine is meditation because meditation is really what relieves the toxins from your mind. And when the mind gets detoxed, everything gets detoxed. So then you don't have to go to a detox center. If you're meditating every day, you're detoxing your mind. If you're detoxing your mind, you're detoxing your habits. If you're detoxing your habits, you're leading a detox life. Why do you need then detox? You don't need detox. So that is how you take care of inflammation. All right. So what is the mother of all anti-inflammatory medicines? You'll say, well, doctor, can I take a pill or do you have some puriya or do you have some chevan prash or do you have some goli or somebody sells this thing, you can get 30 tablets for, for $50 and somebody sells this liquid, you put one liquid, one spoon every day and it's anti-inflammatory or you take one spoon of this concoction. No, no, you don't need that. You only need that if you're leading an inflammatory lifestyle. If you're leading an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, you do not need any supplements. For good health, you need zero supplements. You need a good anti-inflammatory lifestyle. So we are now going to talk about, in the next session, about the first anti-inflammatory medicine. And that anti-inflammatory medicine is food. Treat food as medicine. If you treat food as medicine and understand that food medicine is pharmaceutical, food is nutraceutical. Eat the food that has nutrients, the micronutrients that I'll explain to you, which are antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, that reduce the, uh, uh, the uh, injury to the organs. That is what you need. So what kind of diet that you can eat which will detox your body? What kind of diet that you can eat, which will be anti-inflammatory? What kind of diet that you can eat, which will prevent heart attack, stroke? What diet is gonna take care of my diabetes? What diet is gonna cure my chronic inflammation in my fatty liver? You have all these questions, right? Stay tuned. The next three lectures will tell you exactly what is anti-inflammatory diet what is pro-inflammatory pro and anti-inflammatory, what to eat, what not to eat, how to eat, how much to eat, and we'll discuss all that. So thank you very much. Always remember, you do take care of your health by going to your doctor and, and taking medicine that you're taking right now and doing all the tests, but add to that the self-care that we're learning today. When you combine healthcare with self-care, you get wellness. Practice IWSP, Whatever you learn today, let it sit in your brain, marinate. Some you may agree with, some you may not. Some may take time. Give it space in your mind. Experiment, experience, and then find out that best teacher is your own experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for that wonderful talk on inflammations. The subject is uh, so intriguing. Every time I listen, I pop up a few more questions. And as you see the inflammatory, the subject is becoming so, so evident. People talk about even inflammatory speeches. If you talk inflammatory speech, it's not only affect um, the emotions also the people. So I just wanted to talk to uh, one questions, maybe all of uh, some of the participants also may have is suppose we understand and go through this IWSP course, how long it takes to detox the body as for IWSP? You have any uh, thing to share? Dr. Sharma, please. Yes, so the, the detox begins on day one. So day one, you already, just by making a commitment to join IWSP, you have already made a huge step towards detoxification because you have actually convinced your mind that you are now on the road to changing your lifestyle. 
So that's good. Congratulations. So it begins today. Now, to what extent it is going to be effective depends upon with what intensity and with what regularity of practice you bring those changes in your life. So if you do them on a consistent basis and increase the percentage of practices that we talk about sequentially, then it'll, get, it'll be faster. So the speed duration depends upon the speed and duration of your effort and your commitment. Yes, uh, we have a few questions also in the chat box. I will take up one by one. The first question is on the about the kids. It tells that some of the kids also has a, a belly showing up. Is this a fatty liver? Yeah, so first of all, uh, if the kid has a belly, that kid is mostly eating at home. So that means that that food that you're eating that the kid has a belly from, probably you may have it too. So you have to change the family habits of eating in the kitchen for everybody. Now, yes, some kids are born with excessive fat cells in the beginning. So as I, to I told you in my uh, previous session, uh, a third of us, no matter what we do in life, we are born big, we, leave, we live big, and we die big. So there is clearly a genetic predisposition to being big. So just because you're big, don't feel bad. Don't go into those vanities and the body shaping that you have to be certain shape and size. No, I have seen people that are thin and skinny, but have tremendous inflammation in their body. On the other hand, I've seen people that are big and fat and they have very little inflammation in their body. So the idea of body size, please get that out of the mind. Get the idea of non-inflammatory body. So size doesn't matter. Inflammation matters. And inflammation depends upon what kind of lifestyle you lead. And if you follow the DASH program, you're going to reduce the inflammation. So always keep a focus on reducing inflammation, not on the body size and not on the body shape. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very, very interesting way of observations. Uh, and there is a question on what are the symptoms of fatty liver? So if you have fatty liver, which is advanced, then you will have some problem in your uh, uh, digestion. And you will also have certain tests that you can do. For example, you can do liver enzymes, which will be elevated, or you can do an ultrasound, which will show fatty liver. But there's a simple thing I tell people. I said, look, there is a very simple, straightforward, cheapest test that you will ever come across to know whether you have metabolic syndrome or fatty liver or problems or not. Do yourself a favor. First thing in the morning, go into your bathroom, take everything off except your underwear and stand sideways in front of the mirror. If your belly is in front of your chest, in other words, the belly protrudes out more than your chest, that means you have excessive body fat in the truncal area. If you have truncal body fat, you will have metabolic syndrome. You will have fat in your liver because when you have excessive fat in your body, the first site of storage is actually liver. Second is your skeletal muscle that use it up. And whatever the liver and the skeletal muscle cannot dispose of gets deposited in your belly. So I, I explain it this way, you know, the fridge and the freezer. So when there's extra food cooked in your house, right? You eat some and there's leftover. What do you do? You put it in the fridge. If it's way too much food, what you do is you put a portion in the fridge and the rest you put in Ziploc bags and put in the freezer that you'll use it six days or 10 days from now. That's exactly what your body does. If you put an extra sugar in your body, it gives a sugar to the skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles say, oh, I'm not being used today. I'm going to lie down in bed. So skeletal muscle not using the sugar. Then that sugar is taken from the skeletal muscles to the liver. So liver stores your glycogen. So liver is your fridge. Now fridge can only take so much. So what the liver cannot take, then your blood takes it to your belly. And there's a huge storage organ here. You can store as much as you want. That's your freezer. So if you have a freezer, you have fatty liver. Yes. Thank you. It's a very, very, very interesting way to test self-test with a zero cost. Okay, you don't have to go anywhere. So there is a one question on uh, what are the causes of leaky nose? 
Sorry. There is a question on what are the main reasons for leaky nose? Nose is leaking. What are the causes? You mean the, there's a dripping from the nose? Yeah, draining in the nose. That means it appears to be a lot of mucus coming out in the nose. What are the under what circumstances? Multiple causes. So uh, if you have some infection or you have some uh, uh, sinusitis or chronic sinusitis or allergies, then you're going to have those. And some people can have this if there's some kind of brain issues where they have rhinorrhea, where the CSF fluid comes out. So you really have to see a specialist. You have to see a uh, ENT specialist and you have to see a neurologist to know exactly what the cause of that is. But there is one more thing I tell you, if you do pranayamas, these secretions get less. And if you change your diet, these secretions get less. So these extra secretions in your body that come out that you notice, if you change your diet and do breathing exercises, the pranayama, they get less. Yes, uh, also I'd like to um, inform all of you that if you have any specific uh, problem with your health, you can also reach our helpline number, it will connect one-to-one -to, -one to the doctor for specific issues. Other than that, the general questions we are taking up. Now, one question on a person who had COVID. So the question is, since I had COVID, I have multiple sequential issues like skin allergy, eye, hair, eye, hair fall, knee pain, arm joint, various kinds of pains. So in this inflammation, I was told it's a long-term COVID impact. Any comment, Dr. Sharma? Uh, so that is that is something that we are still learning. We, we really do not have full handle on post-COVID syndrome. So what you have is this: all the symptoms that you describe, we lump them together and we call it post-COVID syndrome. And as we are going along, we are learning more and more about it. But at the bottom of all this really is your inflammation has been set to a higher level after the infection. And somehow it does not reset back to the baseline. So this heightened inflammation that you have because of the COVID infection, which lingers on in your body, at least from your point of view, you can do four things. You can change your diet to an anti-inflammatory diet that we recommend. You can do your physical activity, increase activity and add yoga, pranayama and meditation to that. Reduce your stress level and change your habits. Stay away from processed sugar, processed grain and uh, too much fat, especially omega-6 and animal fat. And at the same time, change your habits if you're drinking or smoking or one of those things. So if you follow these four principles, core principles of DASH program, you will definitely cut back on your inflammation over a period of time. Now, I've had a lot of patients that have had these post-COVID symptoms. The good news is that with the passage of time, a lot of these things get better. So stay optimistic, try your lifestyle, give it time. There is no medicine. We do not know any medicine for post-COVID syndrome. So the answer lies in leading an anti-inflammatory life and being patient and giving it time and hopefully you'll feel better. Yes. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Dr. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Subrata sir. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, for all your answers. Uh, we'll go to the next uh, uh, session. Uh, My system. Okay. So we'll move on to asanas and uh, the medical benefits uh, explanation from Swamiji as well as the practice. So get onto your mat. Let us learn about the health benefits of doing yogic jogging, sukshma vyayama. Before we start doing any asanas, we should do yogic jogging. Yogic jogging has immense health benefits and it's very safe. If you want to go run outside, there is always a danger of getting into accidents, especially in situations like COVID pandemic, we are worried to go out. So, yogic jogging is done in our own place, in a safe place. So, it's very 
safe to do yogic jogging. When you do yogic jogging, our blood supply to every cell of the body increases. It also makes your heart strong. It's a cardiac exercise too. It also increases the stamina and it makes you ready to go and practice the asanas further. So everyone should practice yogic jogging daily to make our body strong, to increase the stamina. When it comes to Sukshma Vyayama, it's very vital. Before we go and learn the asana, the postures, we should practice Sukshma Vyayama or the loosening exercises. In the Sukshma Vyayama, the main benefits we find is it makes all the joints strong, flexible, free from rigidity, free from all sorts of inflammation. In brief, all itis like osteoarthritis, like synovial fluid inflammation, all these things can be cured by practicing the Sukshma Vyayama properly. In the Sukshma Vyayama, what we do? We rotate the joint in all the angles. Complete ro rotation of the joints. Flexion and extension of the joint. Also, sideward movement of the joint. What are the benefits of Sukshma Vyayama? It makes the muscles around the joint strong. All the reasons for pain around the joints like osteoarthritis of the knee, plantar fasciitis, frozen shoulder is because of the weak muscles around those joints. So Sukshma Vyayamas makes our muscles strong. It also increases the blood supply to the joints. So high Sukshma Vyayamas have got immense health benefits. Right from our wrist joint, when you do the wrist rotation, extension flexion of the wrist, we are free from the pains around the wrist joints and your wrist joint becomes strong. Similarly, you might have heard about tennis elbow. Pain around the elbow because of using the muscle in only one direction. So when we do Sukshma Vyayama for the elbow joint, stretching and flexion and extension of the elbow joint, you are free from the elbow joint pain. It makes your elbow strong. Similarly, when we do shoulder movement, Sukshma Vyayama for the shoulder, rotation, extension and flexion. This also helps to make you free from the pain of the shoulder and frozen shoulder and rotation of the neck and also flexion, extension and rotation makes your muscles around the cervical spine very strong. So how you are free from cervical spondylitis. Similarly, when we do the Sukshma Vyayama for the hip joint, we are free from low back ache. It makes your posture, the spinal cord strong. It gives you proper posture. Similarly, when you do Sukshma Vyayama for the knee joint, you are free from osteoarthritis of the knee. Osteoarthritis of the knee, which is very common in people above 40, can be cured by doing the proper Sukshma Vyayama for the knee joint, extension and flexion of the knee joint. Similarly, plantar fasciitis, pain in the ankle joint is very common. So Sukshma Vyayama done properly for the uh, ankle joints makes you free from plantar fasciitis. 
In brief, when we do Sukshma Vyayama, we are free from all the itis pain, inflammation of the joints. When you do properly, you are now ready for the next asanas. So why? Every one of us must practice Sukshma Vyayama every day before we go ahead and practice asanas. Namaste. Welcome you all to this yogic practice. We'll start today the first one with yogic yogic practice. So stand comfortably on your mat with legs apart and loose. Prepare yourself mentally and physically for the yogic yogic practice. So take a th three deep breaths first. Deeply in, completely out and try to relax your whole body with each exhalation. Deeply in, completely out. Be plain, last one. And completely out. Relax. Let's start the first practice. And before you start, if you have knee pain, if you have back pain, go slowly. If you're a beginner, so practice it slowly. If you do not have any of these issues, so you can practice with me with the advanced level. Let's begin with the first one. Jogging. So you have to start with a simple marching. Simple and slow marching on your plates. And start the jogging slowly with a slow pace. Make a fist through your hands and keep jogging. Nice and slow. Breathe normally. And slowly decrease your pace. Slow down. Again, you have to march and relax slowly. Bring your hands down and relax. Next, going for the second, yogic jogic. Second practice, again, we'll go for the jogging with the movement of our hands. So let's start this practice, alternate combination of right and left. So you need to rip your right knee and left hand, then right knee and left hand, alternately left and right. If you're a beginner, practice this. If you want to go for advanced, practice the next one with me. Let's begin. Simply, alternately, you have to practice. I'll show you from the side the same movement. So you can understand better this one, how to practice. Last 10 seconds, keep going. Improve your heart rate as five. Four, three, two, slow down, one, relax. So we have completed the second practice of jogging. Next, moving for the third practice, it is knees to the chest. So open your legs comfortably apart, place your hands on your waist and slowly touch your knee to the chest. Lift your right and left leg and try to bring it closer to the chest. I'll show you from the side. This is for the beginners. If you feel any pain on your knees, on your back, so go with this, in the first one. In the second one, if you're going for the advanced, go with a jump like this. Go with a simple jump and bring your knee as close as possible to the chest. Last 10 for the same. Five, four, three. Two, one, relax. Bring your hands down. Moving for the next, the fourth one, the knees bent. So keep your legs close. Place your hands again on your waist. And with exhalation, you have to bend your knees together. Simply bend it as much as possible. And then come back. Exhale, bend, and slowly come back. I'll show you from the side. There is a no change in this practice, you have to practice the same for continuous 30 seconds. Knees bent and come up. You can breathe normally as well in this practice. Focus on your knees. 
plus five, four, three, two, one. Relax, hands down. Moving for the next, fifth one, the leg stretching practice. So this time, open your legs in the wide distance. Keep your legs three to four feet apart. The first leg stretching, the simple one. You need to bend your right knee, push your hips down and stretch your thighs. Then change, place your hands to the right and push your hips down again, continuously. Right and left. Keep stretching your legs alternately from both the sides. Be comfortable and keep your feet grounded. Do not lift them. Just focus forward at any one point and keep going for 30 seconds. Alternately right and left. Last five. Three, two, one. Relax. Slowly come back. Hands in the same position. Legs are in the same position. Moving on for the leg stretching too. This is the fifth, sixth exercise. So this time you have to change angle. Twist your body right side and left side with this practice. So firstly, twist your right foot towards your right and push your hips down along with the hands on your waist. Right toe in, left toe out, slowly push your hips down and change. You have to change the angle every time, every single time. Right and then left. Change. Keep changing it, be continuous. Change the foot, direction of your foot, push your hips down as down as possible and keep changing it. Go for continuous 30 seconds. Just focus on the good stretch to your legs, to your hips. Last five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Slowly come back. Hands down. Keep your legs close, relaxed. Next, seventh one. Open your legs and the wide distance again. So this is the exercise where you have to stretch your hands backward, make an arch and join your hands forward with a curve. So just look at me from the front, stretch your both the hands in the front, join your palms. And as you inhale, open the chest, arch the back, look up. And as you exhale, make a curve, join your palms in front of your head, inhale open. Exhale, bend. So breathing is important here. Go with the deep breathing. Inhale, open. Exhale, forward. Inhale, open. Exhale, close. Keep breathing deeply. Backward and forward. Breathe as deep as possible. Complete inhalation. Complete exhalation. Last five. Last round. So like slowly back straight, bring your hands down. If you can stay in the same position, the so eighth exercise, the side stretching. So keep your hands straight, open your hands to the sides, inhale here. And as you exhale, start bending towards your right. Then change, inhale, come back, exhale left. Be gentle to your body, be slow if you're a beginner. If you want to practice advance, just go with me from the next round. Alternately, you have to change, breathe in and breathe out. Always breathe out while bending towards your right, and towards your left. Be continuous to this practice. At least 10 to 12 rounds each side. Till 30 seconds, you need to go right and left. Right and left. Last two. Right and left. 
right side and left. Stretch your side body. Relax. Slowly come back. Open your hands, bring it down. If you want to relax in between, you can keep your legs closed. You can rest for 10 to 15 seconds. Moving on for the ninth exercise. This is twisting. Open your legs again in the wide distance. The three cone asana now practices. Open your hands. If you're a beginner, practice this. Open your hands and with exhalation, twist your body, touch your toe and come back. And again, with exhalation, twist your body, touch your toe and come back. Inhale always here and exhale while touching your toes, right and left. If you want to practice advanced, bend forward and practice continuously. Alternately, touch your toes, right and left. Keep looking upward with every single twist and try to touch your toe. Keep going. Keep stretching your whole back, your arms and head. Last five, four, three, two, one. Relax. Slowly come back to the initial position. Bring your hands down and legs close. Relax here, legs. Moving for the 10th practice, the backward bend and forward bend practice. So keep your legs less than hip width apart distance. Almost two to three inches distance you require to maintain the body balance. And here you have to go with the breathing. While back bending, inhale. And while forward bending, you have to exhale. I'll show you from the, this side. So you can understand better how to do this practice. Bend your back as much as possible while inhaling. And while exhaling, try to reach up to your toes. Inhale, back bend. Exhale, forward bend. Be gentle to your body. Listen to your body always. Be comfortable while doing this. This one stretches your whole body. So keep breathing deeply in and out. In, out. Breathe in, breathe out. Last three. Two. One. Exhale and relax. Stretch your hands up, bring your hands down. Relax, open your legs comfortably apart. Just relax. Eleventh one. So we are going to practice the jumping jack. So if you're a beginner, practice this. Keep your legs close, hands to your outer thighs. You have to jump, open your legs, open your hands, and then jump again. Join your legs, join your hands above your head. And again, jump, come back, then jump. Keep it close to your thighs. So in four steps, you need to perform this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. If you want to do advanced, go with me next. The same practice. You have to jump continuously in this jumping jack practice. Continue. Let's make it 30. Be continuous. Last 10. Keep going. Five, four, three, two, one. Relax. So exhale long, open your legs. Just relax. We have the last one, the 12th exercise. It is hip twisting. So in this one, keep your legs close and open your hands in the front. Join your all the fingers, palm facing downward. So while changing, you have to jump and change the position of your hands and your toes. If your hands are going right, so you have to keep your toes towards left like this, right? Your, you can see, clearly observe my hands direction towards my left and toes direction towards my right. So you have to twist your hips and back. 
with the movement of your hands and legs just change the direction of your foot and hands and keep twisting your hips like this simply be comfortable if you are beginner go slow if you want to practice this let's continue together twist your hips along with me last 10 10 9 8 4 3 2 1 relax hands down open your legs open your hands close your eyes try to breathe deep for complete relaxation breathe in through your nostril and breathe out through your mouth that will help you to instant relaxation to get instant relaxation so breathe in through your nostril breathe out through your mouth five to six times then breathe naturally so if you are a chair person if you are not able to stand and practice with me do whatever the possible movements you can do while sitting in a chair and the second one if you are practicing with me here on the mat so do not practice right away with me firstly observe my posture how i am doing the practice and then gently start with it so if you are not getting all the asanas today onwards there is a no problem we are giving you the handout as well as we are repeating the number of times along with you in this program so you can get it easily all the steps so we are going to start the sukshmana now be ready for that and practice along with me so open your legs out turn towards your left use the whole mat keep your legs close place your hands comfortably along the side for support and let's start with the ankle bending you have to stretch your feet forward with exhalation and with inhalation upward so while breathing in you have to stretch upward and while breathing out you have to stretch forward keep stretching forward and upward breathe out breathe in breathe out breathe in and just focus on your stretch and on your deep breath on these two things keep stretching with a deep breathing and practice this at least 10 rounds relax then next moving on for the ankle rotation so keep your heels in some distance place your hands along the sides and start the ankle rotation same breathing you have to do here while exhaling rotate forward and while inhaling rotate upward so keep rotating here also 10 rounds 10 rounds for clockwise and 10 rounds anti clockwise so keep going clockwise fast exhale forward inhale upward breathe in breathe out just focus on your breath with a movement and keep rotating your toes in a big circle so it stretches your feet even better your ankle even better last round change now opposite anti clockwise 10 9 8 and same breathing you have to follow along exhalation forward inhalation upward last five 4 3 2 one relax keep your legs close relax the next you have to move your knees just upward and downward just flap your knees on the ground keep it together and keep doing it continuously keep the support of your hands to the sides if required keep it back that's also fine and just flap your knees on the ground back of your knees on the ground continuously at least for 30 seconds you can get better blood circulation into your body with this practice with the sukshmayana practices last 10 5 4 3 2 1 relax and after completing this relax your legs 
couple of natural breaths, four to five breaths. And where you have the second one after completing this, next pose is the bird of flag. So again, turn towards your right. Come to the center of your mat and fold your legs first. Fold your legs, join your feet, keep your heels close to the body. Grab your legs, straight back. If you're making a curve like this, so firstly open the chest, keep your back straight. Hold your legs and let's start the butterfly pose. Here you have to freely swing your knees as the wings of the butterfly. Find a comfortable rhythm and go with that freedom continuously. Imagine, visualize that you're swinging your wings as butterfly stools. And keep stretching your hips, your inner thighs with this practice. Focus on this stretch. If you want to do a little bit advanced, try to touch your outer thighs on the ground. If not able to touch, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Be gentle to your body. Listen to your body always. And do comfortably this practice. Let's make it continue for a minute, up to a one or two minute, this practice. To improve the mobility of our joints, or hip joints, make it continue. If you can, try to touch your outer thighs, try to touch your knee, knees on the mat. Last 30 seconds. And keep your breath normal. No need to breathe deep here. Just be, breathe normally in this practice. Last five, four, three, two, one. Slowly, slow down, open your legs out, place your hands back and just relax your legs. Simply relax your thighs, relax your legs muscles. And we are completed here with the upper body practices. Now moving on for the upper body, Sokshvayama. So now moving forward, for the third practice in Shokshvama, the upper body practices. Let's start with the hand clenching. Stretch your hands in the front, make a loose fist, keep your thumb in and make a loose fist. And as you inhale, you have to stretch it all the fingers as much as possible. And as you exhale, contract them. Keep your thumb always in while exhaling. So inhale, stretch and exhale, contract. Inhale, stretch, and exhale, contract. Make your breath take five and change. Now next is wrist rotation. So while inhaling, you have to rotate it upward. While exhaling, you rotate it downward. Two, breathe in, breathe out. Three, four, five and change, opposite, breathe in while rotating up, breathe out while rotating down, four, three, two, one. Next change, turn your palms upward, breathe in and breathe out. So while stretching your hands straight, breathe in, while bending your elbows, breathe out, three, four, Five, inhale open, exhale bend. Now change, open your elbows out. Inhale open, exhale bend. One, two, focus on your deep breathing. Three, breathe in, breathe out. Last one, five, and change. Stretch your hands upward. One, two, and the breathing should be same. Inhale, stretch, exhale, bend. Three, four, 
five and change. Bring your hands down for a while. Release the tension from your arms. Next one is the shoulder rotation. So here also while breathing it in, rotate upward while breathing out, rotate downward. So open your hands to the sides, turn your palms upward, touch your shoulders. Let's start the shoulder rotation. Inhale, one, and exhale back. So inhale while stretching upward, and exhale while stretching backward. Three, focus on your breathing and release the tension from your shoulders, from your neck with this rotation. Continue with the deep breathing, last five, and change, oppose it. Same breathing while inhaling, stretch upward, while exhaling, stretch downward. Four, three, two, one. Exhale and relax. Bring your hands down to your knees, relax your arms, relax your breath. Next, the fifth. Shukshrama, pulling the hands. So for this one, you have to go with the breathing along with me. Gentle to your body and always listen to it while doing this practice. Let's start. Open your hands from the sides. Raise your hands and just clap your hands like this. Inhale, extend that. And as you exhale, pull your right hand through your left one. And stretch your arms, stretch your shoulder with this. Inhale up. And exhale down. Change. Now you have to go from the next side. Inhale up, breathing should be same. And exhale down. Inhale up, four. And exhale down. Alternately stretch your right hand and left hand, five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine, ten, last one. Exhale. Now release in the same way. Inhale up and exhale down from the sides. Bring your hands back onto your knees. Six practice, pushing the head and hand against each other for the cervical practice. So you have to breathe in while taking the position and hold the breath while applying the pressure here. So let's begin. Slowly, you have to practice with me. Raise your right hand. Keep it to your right side as you inhale. Keep your back straight. And as you hold your breath, try to apply the pressure towards each other. Try to push your head towards your left. And try to push your hands towards your right. Apply the pressure through your head and hands against each other. Then bring your right hand down with exhalation. Inhale, raise your left hand. Hold the breath and apply the pressure through your hand. And keep your head remain stable. Do not drop your head towards the left or right. Keep it stable and feel the pressure on your cervical region. Then chase the hand. Inhale, three, hold the breath and apply the pressure through your right hand. Then change, exhale down, inhale four. Hold the breath, apply the pressure and bring your all the attention towards your cervical raising. That helps you reduce the pain. Then change with exhalation. You have to practice this four to six rounds like this. Moving on. For the second, interlock your fingers. Now we'll apply the pressure with the same breathing technique in the forehead and in the back of the head. So keep your hands with the interlock fingers behind the head, just back of the head. Inhale here and hold the breath. Try to apply the pressure forward through your hands and keep your head remain stable. Bring your all the attention to your cervical region with the whole breath. And change, release, exhale. Keep it in the forehead. Inhale here. Hold the breath and try to apply the pressure back through your hands. Keep your head stable. 
apply the pressure through your head and hands equally. And exhale, change. With a whole breath, always you have to apply the pressure. Inhale and hold the breath. Apply the pressure through your hands and head. And change, hold, inhale, hold the breath. Apply the pressure. Again, same. Try to push it back. And through the head, apply the pressure forward and release slowly inhale and exhale drop your hands last we have the neck movement the seventh one so for this one just grab your knees through your hands comfortably and keep your back upright let's start with the upward and downward movement we'll also go all these practices along with the breathing so that helps to improve the flow of prana. Let's start. As you inhale, lift your chin up, push your head as far as back you can. And as you exhale, chin down, close to the chest. Inhale up. Exhale down. Inhale up. Three. Exhale down. While breathing in, lift your chin up, push your head as far as back you can. And while breathing it out, try to touch your chin to your chest. Inhale, five, exhale, down. Last round, inhale, six, exhale, down. Relax, keep your head straight, relax. Moving on for the next, the neck twisting. You have to breathe same. While twisting, just exhale. And while coming back to the center, you have to inhale. So you're in the center position. So breathing, inhale here. And while breathing out, slowly twist your head towards your right side. And just look at the line of your right shoulder. Then change, breathe in, come back. Then breathe out. Twist your head towards your left now. Just look at in line of your left shoulder. Breathe in, come back, breathe out, press it right side. Three, change, breathe in and breathe out. Four, change, breathe in and breathe out. Five, last one, breathe in and breathe out, six. And feel the stretch to your sides. Release, slowly come back and change. The third one, neck bending. So this time drop your head towards your shoulder. And while exhaling, try to keep your ear close to your shoulders. Back, back straight, hold your knees. Inhale here. And as you exhale, drop your head towards your right shoulder. Slowly come back. Inhale, and as you exhale, drop your head towards your left shoulder. Then change, keep changing it. Breathing in, breathing out, three. Breathing in, breathing out. Last two, five. Exhale. Keep your ear as close as possible to your shoulder and change, breathing in and breathing out towards the left. You are close to the shoulder and come back. And after these stretching, we are going for the complete rotation, the neck rotation for five rounds, clockwise and anti-clockwise. So straight back, hold your knees, drop your head gently. And again, you have to breathe here while breathing in, rotate upward. And while breathing out, rotate downward. So as you inhale, rotate upward. And as you exhale, rotate downward. Practice with me. Three, inhale up, exhale down. Four, inhale up, exhale down. Be gentle to your neck. Five, inhale up, 
and exhale down. Give a gentle rotation around your neck. Change, opposite. Inhale and exhale. Five, four, three, inhale up. Exhale down, two, inhale up. Exhale down, last round, one, inhale up, and exhale down. Slowly keep your head straight. We are completed with all the practices of Shokshnama. Close your eyes gently, place your hands on your knees, and consciously feel the effects of all these practices. Enter your body, into your all the joints, to your muscles. Now, let us know the health benefits of pranayama. When we say pranayama, it's all about circulation of the prana shakti in the body, proper circulation. Pranayama helps to circulate the prana shakti, vital energy, to every cell of the body. When we think of anulomulom, alternative nasal breathing, when we learn and practice anulom ulom properly, it has got immense health benefits, physical and mental. Mental diseases like anxiety, depression, sleeplessness, all this can be cured by practicing anulom ulom properly. It also makes your mind calm. It balances the chemistry of your body, which means the release of the hormones, if disturbed, can be balanced. So why it has got immense benefits on alone alone. Now let us learn about the health benefits of Brahmbri. Brahmbri is a wonderful pranayama. Again, it has got immense health benefits when it comes to mental disorders like anxiety, depression, sleeplessness. So when Brahmri practiced properly, people who had sleep disturbances, problems like anxiety depression were relieved all from all those. So in a way it brings tranquility, tranquility, samatvam, physical and mental. When it is attained, you are from, free from major diseases. So, Anulom Ilom Brahmri practiced properly can make you physically, mentally fit, thereby making you free from physical and mental diseases. Now we are moving forward for the Pranayama sequences. So let's take the position for the pranayama. Slowly turn your palms upward, your back of the hand resting to your knees. Keep your back upright, shoulders and head relaxed. And from your both the hands, you can make initially Chana Mudra. You just have to touch your index and thumb tip and rest off three fingers straight in your knees. And then gently close your eyes. Feel the touch from the surface. Observe your seated posture. And mentally prepare yourself for the pranayama. And we'll start with the first one, anulom vilom pranayama, the alternate nostril breathing. If you're a beginner, just look at me, look at the instructions. After that, you can practice. So in this one, you have to make prano mudra from your right hand. In this one, you just have to fold your index and thumb like this. And keep your rest two fingers straight. While changing it, you have to use your thumb and your ring finger. So this is the position of Pranav Mudra. You can see that clearly. Now, so through your right hand, through your thumb, you have to close your right nostril. And slowly 
Intake the breath. Inhale through your left one. Then change the nostril. Close your left one and open your right nostril. Then slowly exhale through your right. And inhale with the same one. Change your nostril, right nostril close, open your left one, slowly exhale. Inhale with the same one. Then change your nostril, left nostril close, open your right one. Exhale through your right. Inhale with the same one. And remember, after every inhalation, you have to change your nostril. Make your breath slow and deep. Inhale. And change the nostril. Exhale first. Inhale later. And keep changing your nose after every inhalation. Exhale and inhale. Nostril change, exhale, and inhale with the same one. Your eyes remain closed, and let's practice with me with a complete awareness. Keep changing your nostril, your nose, after every inhalation. Make your breath Slow and deep. Be conscious of your breathing. How the breath reaches from nostril till the abdomen with your inhalation. And how it reaches and how it comes out from abdomen till the nostril with exhalation. Feel the length of your breath. From nostril till the abdomen with your inhalation and abdomen till the nostril with exhalation. Inhale with the same one and keep changing it. And feel that your every single breath, you're intaking the freshness which is present in the air, in your environment. So your each inhalation energizes your body and your each exhalation brings relaxation, helps to release the toxins from your body. And continue. So with this feeling, energize your body with each inhalation and with each exhalation, release all the toxins away from your body. Make your breath slow and deep, slow exhalation, slow inhalation. Keep changing it. Just be with your breath. Complete your circle through your left one. You started with the left inhalation, so you have to end with the left exhalation. Complete your circle through your left. Exhale completely and release the practice. Bring your right hand back to your knee. Eyes remain closed. Bring your attention inside and just observe how you feel. Feel the effects, the positive effects of these practice. So the next practice is humming bee breath, Brahmri Pranayama. In this one, you have to vibrate your skull, vibrate your forehead, and feel those vibrations around your forehead onto your brain. And when you do this, 
you have to chant silently more sound in the hindi word you have to silently humming the sound with the closed mouth do not open your mouth and feel all the vibrations here i'll tell you the procedure how you need to go just look at me so take your hands up and through your thumbs you have to close your ears gently so you can't hear the outside sounds do not suppress it do not leave it very loose comfortably close it then keep your index finger to your forehead and rest of three fingers in front of your eyes so your fingertips touches to the base of your nose so take a long deep breath in first fill the breath completely in and with the exhalation slowly chant like a humming bee so like that you have to practice you can say like a hindi let word ma with a closed mouth and try to vibrate it or just vibrate it as a humming bee sound and feel all the vibrations towards your forehead towards your brain let's take position close your ears eyes take a long deep breath in and stop mm. chant till complete exhalation breathe in last one mm. eyes remain closed bring your hands back to your knees feel the silence feel those positive vibrations around your forehead to your nerves around the brain and feel the instant calming effect just be with this feeling and you can practice this 3 to 5 rounds regularly so keep your eyes closed be comfortable and try to mentally recall all the practices that you have done today the yogic yogic practice the 12 different exercises sukshyama the seven exercises and this two pranayamas anulom vilom and a brahmari and just feel the effects of all these practices to your body let's bring lot of changes to your health all the practices have to improve your overall health and well being you're feeling good positive refreshed and energized after completed all these practices slowly join your hands 
rub your palms, warm up your hands. Generate the heat, the energy to your hands and apply this to your eyes, to your face. And gently open your eyes. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Swamiji and the book in there. Uh, if there is any questions, uh, we can put uh, Swamiji uh, is uh, live. Um, so also, we may have a lot of questions, a lot of asanas we, we, we were teaching that how are you going to follow it? Don't worry, it will be done every single day in the next 10 sessions. So you will get a hold of it. On top of it, you will also get a handouts which will have all the details. You can spend some time and then come for tomorrow's session, you'll be able to slowly get it. Don't, don't worry about it. Uh, Swamiji, uh, there is one question came personally. Uh, any suggestion on how to handle it for the people who is seated on the chat? You are on mute, Swamiji. Still, we are not able to hear you. You are on mute. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Sorry about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very nice to see our participants practicing together asanas and pranayamas. We keep on learning. The more you practice, the more you become comfortable and you start enjoying. Anything that you learn in the beginning looks like it's too much, but it is made very simple. Asana, pranayama, prayer, meditation. This is how we are going to take you. I'm sure you will be enjoying every day, every session. With this uh, uh, opening note, yeah, people who are not able to sit down on the ground, for them I suggest to sit on the chair and focus mainly on the sukshma vayamas. For example, wrist movement, ah, elbow movement, shoulder, neck movement. Yes, our main focus is to make our body and mind free from the inflammation. Something is irritating my body and mind. When that irritation is removed, you are going to regain the wonderful health that you want to enjoy. So, the Sukshma Vyayamas, anybody can do sitting on chair. So, once you are comfortably able to do Sukshma Vyayama, then what we suggest is, you wherever you are there, if you are able to stand, again according to your age and physical condition, you have to see. So, if you are able to stand, Please stand and just move your limbs up and down. Rather than yogic jogging, you can just move, make your movement. So then similarly, the asanas, for example, if we are asking you to bend forward, you can sit on the chair and bend forward. So again, try to understand the basic science behind every asana and pranayama is to remove the inflammation by providing proper oxygen supply and blood, blood supply to every cell of the body. This is the basic science behind the yoga asana and pranayama. When you have learned this, now you yourself will be able to understand. If I am aged or my body is not able to allow uh, and sit down and do, no problem. So sit on a chair, whatever the movement you can do, up to whatever you can try. And slowly, slowly, when you keep on trying, your body becomes flexible. So this is the one of the greatest advantage of practicing asana and pranayama. It gets your body, it makes your body flexible. And it will get the coordination. People may have giddiness, swaying when they walk, that will be gone. So you will get good coordination of the body. And you will get a good gait, body posture. So, slowly, slowly, when you practice towards end of this program, I am sure you will be, you will be able to sit down and practice. So, in the beginning, if you are not able to sit down, don't worry, sit on a chair and practice whatever a little possible. 
slowly slowly once you learn you will be able to sit down and practice all the asanas with us yeah thank you swamji um there are